Agape. With that, we need to turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. We're looking at the first 11 verses. Title of our study this morning, Running to Win. Chapter 12 here in Hebrews begins with the word therefore. And I was taught early on when we find the word therefore, we need to ask the question, what's it there for? It's there to say in light of, because of, in response to all the things we've considered up to this point, but especially the things we've looked at in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, the heroes of faith. Therefore, he says, we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The heroes of faith that we looked at last time, well, actually for the last uh, uh, 10 weeks, some of them died for their faith. All of them died in faith. What's the difference? Well, those who lived prior to the cross, they died looking forward to God's promise of a Messiah, of an atonement, of someone who would come and suffer and die for them, bleed for the remission of their sins. That's exactly what Jesus did. So if you can get the picture, they died looking forward to the cross. We, if we die, well, usually that's what happens. But if we're alive until the rapture, we won't die. Those of us who aren't, we will die. But we die looking backward to the cross because there's always been only one plan for salvation. It was always about Jesus. It was always about the cross. And so he's talking about those who died in faith. But some died for their faith. And we talked about them last time. Those many martyrs, we saw that the word translated witnesses here comes from the Greek word for martyr. And so these are those who not only lived and testified, but those who suffered and died for their faithful testimony to the Lord. Now, the word witness can mean just that. Someone who stands up and tells the truth. You remember? Well, I don't know. I've only seen it in the movies. But, I, you know, people swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's giving testimony in court. But this word witness can mean and may here mean spectators. Now, it's possible, and this happens a lot, that it means both in this context. Because he says there are a great cloud of witnesses. You kind of can get the picture that we're not just looking back at their example, but they're looking on at our performance in this day. How are we doing? And I was thinking about this. If it's true that they can see us, those who've gone before us, people like Abel and Enoch and Noah and, and and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Moses and Joshua and Rahab and David and Peter and James and John and, and Paul. If they're actually looking on and well, whether they are or not, the day will come when we'll be with them. And one of the things we learn in this part of this chapter is that they're waiting for us to finish our race. Because the award ceremony takes place when the race is finished. And it's, it's a marathon, you see, and it's, well, it's a relay race. They've run their course. They've finished their race. Now we're running, and they're waiting for us. And I was thinking, you know, you're waiting in line, and someone's going to get the gold, and someone's going to get the silver, and someone's going to get the bronze. And, and you're like thinking, you know, I suffered a lot down there. I'm pretty sure I got something coming. And, and the guy's like, yeah, what'd you go through? And he's like, well, I built. I mean, I built for the Lord. I worked for the Lord. By the way, who are you? He's like, well, I'm, I'm Noah. I built the ark. And, well, I guess I didn't really build anything that would save like that. But, 
And then, you know, you run into somebody else, and it's like, so, so what what did you give up down there? And you say, well, I gave up the beach for Chico. I mean, talk about suffering. <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, who are you? And he's like, I'm Abraham. I left everything and everyone behind to go to the place God would promise as an inheritance, but never even built the house there, just lived in tents with my family. Well, you know, sometimes... We suffer and, and we go through it for a season. I've prayed for things and God's promised them and I've waited five whole years for him to come through. Sometimes 10 or 15. But you know, if we run into Moses up there, he's going to go, I know what you mean. Yeah, 40 years in the wilderness training for 40 more years in the wilderness. <laughs> it, it, it's like those guys who've gone before, they by far have us. And we're not even supposed to be comparing ourselves with them because those who compare themselves among themselves, we're told, aren't wise. We're supposed to look to Jesus, and that's what he's going to exhort us to do. Well, here's the question. If, in fact, they're watching and they can see and they're looking on, are you encouraged or are you ashamed? Are you proud or are you embarrassed? Are they cheering you on or are they amazing? What are you doing down there? You know, our lack of preparation, our lack of discipline, our, our lack of, well, obedience to the simple commands that will enable us to run our race to his glory. So he says, because of this great cloud, those who've gone before, those who may be looking on, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. It's a call to self-discipline. Later in the chapter, he'll tell us what he does when we don't discipline ourselves because discipline's gonna happen either way. The let us lay aside and later will let us run with endurance reminds us we're running together. We're in this together. I think that's an important point for us today because we live in such a competitive society and the picture he wants us to have is we're not competing with one another as we run our race no we're spurring one another on to good works we're running next to each other so we can say hey we can do better on the next lap it's about a personal best it's not about besting someone else and we'll come back to that idea so here's the thing those who went before finish their race. They await us finishing ours. And we'll all be together and receive our rewards at, there at the um, throne of God. So he says we need to put off, lay aside every weight. Now weights here aren't necessarily sins. In fact, they're contrasted, I think, or at least compared to sin. We're to put off every weight and the sin. So he's not saying every weight is sin. I remember Jesus talking about how the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches can choke out the good seed of God's word. Cares of the world, that's just the stuff we all have to take care of. We got to keep the, the you know, money flowing so we have somewhere to, to raise our families and got to have a running vehicle because this is California and there's no mass transit and, and there's just a lot that we have to do, but the cares of the world can actually ensnare us and entrap us. We can get to where, well, if I worked 60 hours instead of 40, I could really provide. But those extra 20 hours, they rob you of providing what your kids need most if you have them and that's you. So, so if we're going to run well and finish well, we need to put off things that aren't necessarily sinful. They're things that are allowable, even useful perhaps. But for us, they can be a hindrance. By the way, Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, James, Peter, all use this put it away, put it off, stop doing it or stop walking in it. And instead, replace it with. God never asked us to give something up without giving us something better in its place. And it's important to know that, that, well, he can't fill a full cup. So if I'm like, well, I've got everything I need. He's like, I have something better. 
But we have to do what he says, put it away, put it aside, lay it aside. And he says, every weight. Now, you know clothes aren't sinful, at least most clothes aren't sinful. And, and uh, the thing is, they're actually essentials in our society. But if you're going to compete, well, say you're a swimmer because not everyone runs. I ran when I was young, played basketball when I was in between, and now I swim. So I've got to do all of them. But uh, I've never seen anyone swimming in a trench coat. They just don't do it. Why? It would be impossible to compete with somebody who had the, well, the Speedo. That's what they wear, right? It's very, it's very little clothing because they don't want anything to impede their progress or hinder their best possible time. Same thing. You never see anyone running in a race in jeans. Nothing wrong with jeans. My latest jeans, they're fashionable and comfortable. But the point is, I'm not going to wear them to run a race. And so while clothes are essential, they're useful, they're certainly not sinful. If you're running or you're swimming or whatever you're competing in or performing in, man, you got to make sure you put away every possible thing that will hinder. And then he says, the sin which so easily ensnares us. It's a reminder. He's saying, put off sin. Stop sinning. Put it away once and for all. Romans says, we're no longer slaves of sin. And we're called in Romans 6 to stop living as if we were slaves of sin. Instead of yielding to our old nature, yield now to God. Let God have his way just as sin once had its way. When God's speaking to Cain in between his refusal to do right and, and well, the, the, the ultimate outcome of his sin and rebellion and refusal to repent, God says, look, sin's trying to master you, but you have to master it. That's true for all of us. He says we have to put away the sin once and for all, and then he says it ensnares us. That word ensnares doesn't just imply it could trip us up. It's like an active, aggressive force trying to trip us up. So once we deal with thoughts and words and attitudes and actions and habits that trip us up and encumber us, he's saying we still need to be on guard. We still need to watch out lest they take us down. Then he says we're to run our race with endurance. And let us run with endurance the race set before us. And again, we're running together. We're not competing. I already made mention of it. I like to see myself running alongside brothers who are running hard and running to win, going to improve. And Jesus sent those disciples out two by two, I think, for this very reason. That one could be sharing, the other would be praying. One would be there and the other would be, well, it's a partnership. And if you're married, your partner is your spouse. If you're not yet married, your partner is your parent. Or if you're the parent, it, well, it, 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 well, however it plays out for you, you need someone who partners with you in this walk and in this race. I'm thinking about all of the things that happen and all the ways that we get tripped up. And, and, and it's just so important to see it. I have noticed, and I'm sure you've noticed too, that, that I do run better if someone's running alongside me. Well, I don't run anymore. I think I told you that. I had some lower back problems. Can't run, can't play basketball. I do swim. And I've noticed even though I say we shouldn't be competing, when I'm swimming in a lane and I feel somebody coming up and all of a sudden I could see them in my periphery, I am like swimming harder. Now, it doesn't matter that it's a 12-year-old girl. I'm just going to go harder <laughs> because that's my nature. And God actually uses those little idiosyncrasies, those things. He's saying, hey, you're not competing. No, but I'm trying harder. And that's actually okay, you see. And that's going to happen in our Christian experience as well. Now listen, for some, for a few, the race they run is just a sprint. For most of us, it's a marathon. Who ran a sprint and ran well and finished well? 
hey, how about the thief on the cross? You see, he didn't really have much of a chance to live for Jesus, but he did testify. He testified after mocking, as did the other one who was nailed there. You remember Jesus in the center, one of them on each side. They mocked as the people mocked and jeered and all that went down. And then one of them somehow comes to his sense and he's like, his senses, he's like, wait a minute. This man's done nothing wrong. He testifies to Jesus' innocence. Something that happens again and again. The centurion, surely this was a righteous man. Even Judas who betrayed him, I betrayed innocent blood. No one could convict him of sin. And so he's saying, this man's done nothing wrong. We deserve what we're getting. He's confessing Jesus' holiness and innocence. He's confessing his guilt and that it's just that he's suffering this punishment. Then he turns to Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, remember, there's a great cloud of witnesses there looking on, listening in. And he turns to Jesus and says, remember me. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. See, he died that day and, and he found life in Jesus that day. It's like a deathbed conversion. And, and I have seen people and prayed with people that were on their deathbed and, and were like, look, at you are going to wake up on the other side. You are either going to be in heaven or hell. You're either going to be with God or apart from him. And they're like, but I've never believed it's too late. I'm like, no, you're breathing. It's not too late. But the other thing that's happened is we've been called in and people have been unconscious and they never regain consciousness. It's happened to me. It's happened to Pastor Bud. I'm sure Pastor Jacob and the others have experienced it. It's a horrible feeling because we're praying for them and we're praying with the family. But we don't have a way to connect and say, listen, you can still surrender to the Lord. I'm just saying, if you haven't given your life to the Lord, don't wait and think, well, I'll just do it on my deathbed. You don't know that you'll get that chance. But if you've given your life to the Lord, then run the race set before you. And that's the exhortation here. Now, listen, he, the thief on the cross, he had a sprint. Stephen, I don't know how we would put him into the whole thing. Maybe it was a 440. He ran for a while, appointed a deacon, served faithfully, testified boldly. He prayed, Father, don't lay this sin to their charge. Don't put it on their account. That's a radical prayer when you're being stoned to death for simply sharing Jesus. The apostle Paul named Saul at that point after Israel's first king, no doubt. He was there listening. He listened to Stephen pray. Don't lay this sin to their charge. Then he listened to Stephen proclaim, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right end of the power on high. Like he heard it all, you see. So, so he finished well. He didn't have a long testimony, but he had a right testimony, a righteous testimony. He lived and ran and he laid down his life, the first Christian martyr recorded for us in Scripture. There are many others, though. They ran the marathon, and that's what we need to see. For most of us, it is a long, long race. I don't know if you've ever seen those shows. It's, well, I, I came across one somehow and, and, you know, just kind of blip-verting through. And, and I'm like, oh, wow, these guys are preparing to run a race. It was a six-day race in the desert. Same crew had been up and, and ran in the, in the icy, you know, but it, it's just crazy. Six days, they're running at 120-degree temperatures in deep sand and in not-so-deep sand. And, and what they do is they get up in the morning and they run all day, and then at night they rest, and they get up the next day and they run, and at night they rest. That's a better picture of what we're supposed to be doing. Only it's not a six-day race. It starts when we give our life to him, and it ends when we stand before him in glory. So it's every day preparing for the race. Every day putting on the full armor of God because, well, listen, it's not always cheering we hear. 
as we're running our race. Sometimes it's jeering. And, uh, and, and here's why that happens. Those who know us best, our closest relatives, our, our closest friends, they're often, man, you, are, you were a freak before and now you're a worse freak. I think it was, what, well, what's the band? Uh, they, they had that song, Jesus Freak, right? Do you remember? DC Talk, excellent. Yes, if that's for me, I can't really talk right now. So just let them know, we'll call them back. So we're to put off the, the sin, laying aside every weight. We're to run with endurance, the race set before us. Oh, stereo. It's one of those days. Did I mention it would be good to make sure your cell phones are off? I guess not. So listen, just trying to distract me. It won't work. I am going to finish this message no matter what. So some ran a sprint and some ran a 440, but most of us will run a marathon. And I mentioned in the introduction, I believe it's a relay race. So those who've gone before, they ran, they passed off the baton, they went to their reward with the Lord. Now we're running and we will someday pass the baton to those who are going to run behind us. But as we run, it's not about who's listening or who's watching. It's looking to Jesus. The race is set before us, and he says there in verse 2, we're still in verse 2, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Eyes fixed on him. Why? He's run this race. He's experienced everything we can experience along the road. He's been there, and he is, is like, he's calling us to follow in his footsteps, to deny ourselves to take up our cross, to follow him, to finish well. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He began the good work we read elsewhere. He will be faithful to complete it. And for the joy set before him, we read, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the cross, and it says he did it for the joy set before him. What was that joy? You might be surprised if you're new to all this. It's you. You're his joy. You're his treasure. In fact, he tells us in Matthew 13 that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who found treasure hidden in a field. And, and he, he found it, and he hid it, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, some want that to say, this is how we need to be. We need to sell everything or we need to give up everything. Hey, we do need to deny self to follow him. He talks about those who aren't worthy of him. But here's what we need to know. We're not in a position to buy the world. And he told us in an earlier, um, you know, beautiful uh, picture for us in this section. He, he, he says... The field is the world. And so he's the one who finds a treasure in the field. He's the one who sold everything, who gave everything to buy the entire field. And as the father so loved the world, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He, he, he loved the world. Jesus died for the world. We're told not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So he's the one, you see, buying the world because of the treasure within, and you are his treasure. You, you need to put this together. He was with the Father in perfect fellowship, in perfect unity, in perfect harmony. John tells us in the very first verse of his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, that word with means face to face, eye to eye, heart to heart, perfect fellowship, perfect harmony, perfect unity. And then he came down and became one of us, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary sacrifice, rose again, ascended into heaven. Listen, he's right back where he started. Why go through all that? He went through it for you. 
He went through it for me. He went through it for us. He so loved us. He gave his life so we could have life. It says, for the joy set before him, he despised the shame. Shame? Yeah, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst of criminals. And the very fact that he was hanging there on that cross was a shameful thing. And I'm intrigued by the fact that it doesn't say pain. Despise the pain because the scourging he received was so severe that many men died from it, but no one received a greater scourging than he. How do we know? Well, because the Romans, as just as they saw themselves, they also wanted to show mercy. So what they would do in an attempt to get some justice and show some mercy is if you were being scourged as that was happening, if you cried out after that first lash upon your back as your back was ripped open and those sinews and those nerve ends were exposed. If you cried out, I did this, I, I committed this crime, the next stripe would be lesser. If you fail to cry out and confess something, the next would be stronger and the next would be stronger and the next would be stronger and put this together. Jesus had nothing to cry out. He, he, he could say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He cried that out. But he could not confess to a crime or confess to a sin because he didn't sin. And so each stripe was greater. He felt the full brunt of that suffering. And by the way, they tried to give him something when they nailed him to the cross to lessen the pain. And he refused it. Why? He wanted to experience all we had coming. He wants us to see this is how bad sin really is. Those things he says we need to put away and put off and stop doing. Man, he says this is how severe it really is. Well, he despised the shame and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I already mentioned Stephen saw him standing, but his common and normal position today is right there with the father in fellowship with the father for consider him we read in verse 3 who endured such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls not just the weights not just the sins but he says hostility and weariness and discouragement and they can they can trip us up they can cause us to, to, to well, falter in the midst of the race. Again, if those voices aren't cheering, but jeering, mocking, ridiculing, it makes it harder to run. And they did all that to him, you see. Weary and discouraged. Weary is a word that means in your thoughts to the point of illness or despair discouraged we lose heart and confidence and courage exhaustion replaces that joyful expectation of all that we have when we stand before him in glory then he reminds us you have not yet verse 4 resisted to bloodshed striving against sin we talked last time about the martyrs the multitudes of people the, the greatest number of them in the 20th century more than all the centuries leading up to it, persecuted for their faith in Christ. They suffered, they shed their blood, they died as witnesses to the Lord's faithfulness. But he's saying, hey, we haven't gone that far. Most of those he wrote to and most of those who are sitting here today, we have no testimony of, oh, our testimony is, yeah, my friends mocked me or my parents rejected me. or I mean, we've, I'm not minimizing the pain of that, but I am maximizing what he went through to give us life. By the way, scourged, crucified, as I already mentioned, Jesus talks about the danger of persecution of trial of tribulation and by the way he said all those are coming to us in this world you will have tribulation be of good cheer I've overcome 
the world. In this world, you will suffer persecution, rejection, mocking, all of it. And he talked about the one who received the word of God with joy. It's in Matthew 13, same section where those, those other parables come from. And he says, be because he never gets rooted. He has no root in himself. He endures for a while, but when tribulation or persecution come, because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Listen, that can happen. And we've seen it. We've seen people come and they're so excited and they're like, Jesus, I want him. I want that life. I want that forgiveness. And then when they realize, no, this is going to be a tough road. This is going to be a difficult walk. This is going to be a a laborsome life. Well, then they're like, no, I, I didn't sign up for that. And if you've ever wondered what happens to the person who comes and they're so like, it's the 4th of July. They're so high on Jesus and so bright and so shiny. And then all of a sudden they're gone. And you see them and they're like, no, no, that's not for me. I'm done with the Krishna thing now. Or I'm over here at this or I'm just doing my own thing. Man, he says that can happen. So, so we need to make sure not only that we get rooted, but those we love get rooted. Not just that they hear the gospel, but that they're rooted in the word. That they're growing and maturing in the Lord. Have you forgotten, he says, asking the question, verse 5, the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. He says, listen, God speaks to us as his sons and daughters it's, it's the generic word he's talking about his children and you should know that that well his love for us is demonstrated by his loving discipline of us he teaches us he's an example to us he is the perfect example for anyone who's trying to raise a godly family because he teaches and then he well he instructs and then he corrects, and then he disciplines. But the motivation, it's love. And the manner is loving. And it is a proof as if we needed more that he loves us. That we are his children, born again of his spirit, heirs to an everlasting inheritance. You know, there were some who laid claim to a privileged position before the Lord. They were physical descendants of Abraham and they thought that gave them a heads up on everyone else. Well, listen, it did. They at least knew the law and they had the word and they had the feast and the festivals. They had a lot going. But their security was in their physical, natural relationship to someone very much unlike them. And Jesus gets into a heated discussion with them. It's in John 8 and around verse 39 they declare to Jesus, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. He's saying, Abraham, no, you're nothing like him. You are not a descendant of Abraham. Physically, sure. But spiritually, no, Abraham walked by faith. Abraham walked in obedience. They were doing the exact opposite. He said, now you seek to kill me, a man who's told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. Then he says, you do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication. There's no one here who could miss the implication. That is, they're saying, hey, we know your story. We've heard the rumors. We know Joseph's not your dad. And here's the thing. They're saying, we weren't born of fornication. Then they say, we have one father, God. Listen to Jesus' response. It's John 8, 42. You want to look at it later. Jesus said, if God were your father, you'd love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. 
and nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. And then he lays it out. He says, you were of your father, the devil. No, you're never going to see this in one of those books of, you know, well, there's the books who encourage you, the, these promises and these, these affirmations. And he's pretty much just saying, here's how it is. Not that the devil's physical spawn he's talking about spiritually they weren't aligned with Abe who walked by faith they're certainly not aligned with the father who so loved this world he sent Jesus to suffer and die for it he's saying if you really even knew the father you'd love me I came from the father he says at one point if you've seen me you've seen the father you were of your father, the devil. The desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Does not stand in the truth. There's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, it's his native language. He speaks of his own resources. He is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. It is a heavy, heavy accusation. And it comes from the lips of the only one who could know for sure that these things are true. He's saying, by the way, declaring, there's no gray area. Sometimes I talk to people and they're like, I'm kind of on the fence when it comes to Jesus. There is no fence. There is a wall that goes from here to heaven and you never get over it. He is the door, the only entrance, the only way in. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to heaven but by him. No one comes to the Father but by him. The, the point he's making is you're with me or you are against me. You're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. You're either a child of God or you are a child of the devil. He's saying there's nothing in between. So if you are of a mindset that, well, I don't know that I really buy that. Hey, don't believe me. Believe him. He's talking to religious people, Jews who'd grown up with all those things and every, every advantage. And he's saying, if you were of God, you'd hear my words, but you don't because you're not of God. Furthermore, verse 9, and we just have three more verses today. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? It's a side note, but important application for us today. Dad, it's your responsibility it's your job to train to instruct to discipline to earn your children's respect by doing just that and here's what I see more and more in our culture I'm not accusing anyone of it I'm just saying culturally there are far too many fathers who are absent altogether. There are some who are there, but they're like, well, I just want to be friends with my boys. You know, they need a friend. No, they need a father. They need an example. They need an exhorter. They need someone to love them by disciplining them. We already read it. God disciplines everyone he loves. And he is living in a culture, by the way, our writer, where it's assumed that every father teaches and disciplines and does those things. Listen, respect is earned. It should just come with the territory, but we earn it. And part of the way we do that is by being faithful to the Lord. Subjected means submitted in spirit, obedient in words and actions. The goal, of course, is self-discipline. When that doesn't happen, well, God, he does the discipline. And, and, and again, we're still running the race, right? We'll still be running the race next time. But, but, but the point I wanted to make as we get to these last couple verses is, is that, well, if I don't discipline myself, he disciplines me, but for my good. He wants me to finish well. He wants me to finish on holiness. And, and, and he says, they indeed for a few days, verse 10, chastened us as seemed best to them. Some of us live with dads or stepdads. They kind of got mixed up when it came to the discipline thing. They were so far overboard or didn't do 
anything. And, and here's the thing. Earthly dads, they don't always get it right. Why? They're sinners just like us. But, but our Heavenly Father, He always gets it right. They did what seemed best to them, but He, for our profit, that we may be partakers of His holiness. When God disciplines you or me, when God chastises you or me, it's to make us more like Him. It's to bring us back into alignment with His will for our lives. It's not just him showing his displeasure. It's him doing something profitable. And he says so in verse 11, and we conclude with it. No chastening seems to be joyful. To that, we can say, amen. We're not masochists. We're not looking for it. It's not joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. He's saying God's chastening, his loving discipline is productive. It produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It leads to holiness. It leads to faithfulness. So Lord, we thank you today that you've called us to yourself, that you convicted us of our sin. And like that thief on the cross, Lord, we cried out that you'd remember us. Like Stephen, we ask that you'd not lay the, the sin of others to their charge, that you'd forgive them as, as you forgive us, that they would come to their senses repent of their sins and and lord we pray for all the believers in this room we're united in this race we're running we're running together and we're running for a personal best we want to hear well done and enter into the joy of the lord and lord we pray for any and all in our midst who haven't even begun the race because they're still on the other side of the cross They've yet to come and bend the knee and confess that they're a guilty sinner in your holy sight. That you are a holy and righteous and perfect God. And that nothing can bridge this, this chasm, this gap between us. But your son's blood and death on the cross. He died for the remission of our sin. He bled so that we could live. And we pray today, Lord, if there'd be any or many who've yet to say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Forgive my every sin. I confess my need for you. I surrender my life to you. You gave your life for me. I offer my life to you. And if that's you today and you've never done it, well, every head's bowed, every eye's closed, every Christian praying, I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high. It may be that you'll be the only one today. Hey, don't let that stop you. I was the only one who gave my life to the Lord the day I surrendered to him. And I have not had one moment of regret except that I didn't do it sooner. And I want to say the same will be true for you. You will never look back and say, why did I do that? But you may someday say, why didn't I listen? Why didn't I respond? Why didn't I? And listen, you have a choice today. He says you're with him or against him. You're dead in trespasses and sin or you're alive eternally in him. So anyone this hour, anyone this service, if so, raise your hand. And we'll pray together. You've drawn us. Lord, you know us. You're dealing with and working on and working in and working through us. And we offer ourselves afresh. We want more than everlasting life, eternal life, your gift. We want the abundant life you promise to those who yield to you, who walk by faith in obedience, who run to please you, fight the good fight of the faith. Jesus' name, amen.